Many of you in this room know her. She's widely recognized for her dedication to health care for underserved and most vulnerable populations, including ensuring that state and national health care reform efforts enhance care for homeless people, for poor people, low-income people, without inadvertently widening health disparities. She previously served, before she came to DPH last February, as the Chief Medical Officer at Boston Healthcare for the Homeless, the largest nonprofit healthcare organization for homeless individuals in the country. Under her leadership, the organization provided healthcare to over 12,500 homeless men, women, and children in Greater Boston and at 70 different sites. She has been hard at work at the Department of Public Health, and I won't take up any more time saying more about her. You will hear from her yourself. I'm very pleased to welcome our friend, Commissioner Monica Burrell. some of the questions that you um, asked Dean Galea that some of you are feeling unsettled. And um, I would like to say that I feel great comfort in being in a room full of you, individuals who are here, both in leadership positions and on the front line, and many of you I know from my community work, who are there to do what needs to be done to make sure that all of us in Massachusetts, all of us, every single one of us, has access to health and healthy choices. So thank you all for being in this packed room. MPHA, you've done it again. I'm always amazed um, and inspired by your work. But look around you. This is the power of the advocates and the people in Massachusetts who care about the health of the public. And we are in this together. So thank you all for being here today. that I get to speak after the Dean. I always learn something from him, and we're so lucky to have him in Massachusetts. Um, he, he really gave us a bird's eye, uh, national level view of some of the data and things for us to think about. And I'm gonna now um, spend a few minutes bringing us down to the Massachusetts level and talking again about data and how we make our case uh, with data. And you know, it's really important, as the Dean was talking about data and how we really sharpen the way that we look at this, and understand the issues underlying what the data shows, um, this is an important place for us to take a lead in so-called precision public health, if you will. We hear a lot of talk about personalized and precision medicine, which is gonna make great advances in disease management in the decades to come. But we as a community need to think much more, much more about what we can do in the area of precision public health where we take the vast resources of data that we have and information, and we look at it clearly to target the populations at highest risk and target our limited resources to help those populations and look at outcomes. So I'm gonna take you on a um, tour here. If I can find the former key. That's a complicated one, okay. Um, so I wanna start with, um, <laughs> You know, if, when I'm feeling unsettled or in times of transition, I go back to the basics and my basic values. And I've learned um, most of my most important lessons in life from my children and from my patients. And um, you know, the photos you have up here are from um, interactions I've had with patients um, and clinical settings, both globally and locally at Boston Healthcare for the Homeless, which you heard. Um, I worked in and around Boston caring for homeless individuals for 12 plus years. And um, you know, the most important thing, I think, if you take away anything from um, what I'm saying is this connectivity that we have to each other and the work that we're doing at the community level, it's so important for us to listen and hear what individuals need. And this is one of my favorite quotes from Maya Angelou, although I have many. We can learn to see each other and see ourselves in each other and recognize that human beings are more alike than we are unalike. So as we think about that, and I think about how I think we need to shape health policy in the state of Massachusetts, I go back to the interactions I've had with my patients to really use that as a foundation of how I think about the work, the important work that we have to do here in Massachusetts. Um, so to get into that a little bit, this is um, a picture of my DPH house, if you will. Our vision and mission remain the same, which you are all familiar with, around providing access 
to high quality health opportunities for all individuals and um, citizens in the Commonwealth. The foundation, the red area, that's the people who are doing the work. And that's the critical people working both at the department and around in communities in Massachusetts who are doing the work of public health in an inclusive way, in an innovative way, and in a way that is enforcing our mission. The three pillars in the middle is what I've added as our drivers, if you will, to get us to the mission that we have. And that includes looking at data in new and important ways, this concept I've been talking about with precision public health, to understand better the determinants of health, which the dean so eloquently spoke about, how place matters. And then to look for those data disparities and hone in on them and make sure our interventions are getting to the places they need to. So um, to further emphasize that, here's, um, you know, we talk about determinants of health, and here's an example in an educated crowd. What I want to point out here is we know about all of the resource differences that individuals have that really encompass their full sense of health. But I want to point to you that circle in the middle. So I spent um, most of my clinical time working in that circle in the middle, which is talking about individuals' behaviors. And I remember when I was a medical resident at Boston City Hospital and I was working at Dorchester House Neighborhood Health Center one evening and I was talking to a woman about um, how I thought she should exercise more um, and eat better. And um, she then spoke for about 20 minutes straight to me and educated me about her life circumstances and how she was a single mom who worked three jobs and got home just in time to get her kids a meal and put them to bed and how it wasn't safe for her to walk after dark outside with her children and so on and so on. And you know, it started to get me to realize that the remedies for health inequities are not in the clinic exam room. The remedies for health inequities are beyond that. And it's in these other spheres that we think about those social determinants of health. As I'm talking about data, um, you saw um, the dean put up many examples of life expectancy discrepancies. I want to show you this infant mortality rate map from the CDC. This is 2011 data. And what you'll see here is, as is with most health measures, Massachusetts is among the best states. So we have among the lowest infant mortality in the country. And that's great, and that's something that we should be proud of and applaud, and it's years and years of excellent work, health policy advocacy, and excellent access to clinical services. So Massachusetts in general ranks as one of the healthiest states in our nation, ranking third just behind Vermont and Hawaii. And that again is something we should be proud of. But what I'm asking us to do the folks in this room and those of us in this state is to make sure when we're looking at data like this that we uncover what is happening below these means and make sure that we look for areas of data disparities, if you will, where we need to target interventions. I give you an example. When we took this infant mortality rate and looked at some of the data we have in Massachusetts, and we, what you'll see here is this is a hot spotting map that if you note the two red areas, I'll point out to you Worcester, where we are today, and you'll see that the infant mortality rate in Worcester is far worse than the overall infant mortality rate in Massachusetts. In fact, the infant mortality rate in Worcester is about the same as it is in Mississippi, which ranks the 50th healthiest state in the nation. So as we look at our work in Massachusetts, and we continue to think about best practices and ways to continue in our legacy of being one of the healthiest states in the nation, I urge us together to make sure that we look for areas of health inequity and target our services where they're most needed. To go further into this, this is a breakdown of infant mortality rate by race and ethnicity. And you'll see here the Massachusetts total and then the higher numbers for blacks and Hispanics. At the department, we're starting to look at data in different ways like this. I give you this example to make sure that when we're thinking about where we can have the most impact and what policy changes need to put into place, we're looking at the entire picture. For example, in June, we had a data disparities meeting where we had many of our epidemiologists and program staff come together and say, over the years, 
what evidence of data disparities have you seen that lead to inequities that you think we need to focus on and target and do something different about? I give you one example that a staff member brought in. This is the sudden, unexpected infant death rates, and it's broken down by race. And you can see, again, the higher rates among black non-Hispanics and Hispanics in Massachusetts. This is all Massachusetts data. And one thing that we know um, really is effective in decreasing um, sudden infant death is having children sleep on their backs. And if you look here on the right-hand side, you can see the discrepancies, the data discrepancies in whites versus others and having their children sleep on their backs. So when we think about going back to basics and making sure we're looking at our data, here's an opportunity for education that needs to be targeted and specific and culturally and linguistically sensitive that can help change some of these numbers that we're seeing. Another way in which we're using hot spotting or um, targeting is around our response to the current substance use epidemic. You've heard about the epidemic, and as we work towards interventions that are prevention and treatment and recovery access, we're looking at hot spotting in that area as well, and looking at areas of highest overdose death rates, and then looking at ways to place the services. So on the left-hand side, you'll see the overdose death rates by county. On the right-hand side, it's by community. The redder, the higher the death rates. And then the dots will show you um, areas where CSS, or clinical stabilization services, already are. So when we put out a grant procurement, we gave people higher marks where they were putting new services in areas that were hot spots, if you will, but there weren't services in place already. You've seen this data before, um, and I bring it to your highlight, I highlight to you as a very concrete example of how we're using data to understand um, the specifics around how to look at this opiate epidemic. Many of us have worked in the field of substance use disorder for decades and understand this to be a complex health problem. As we look towards solutions, we have to make sure in a precision public health way, we fully understand the issue first. We know that the deaths are soaring. We know that fentanyl has evolved in the last few years and really contributing um, to the death rate. So as we think about harm reduction models, we have to make sure we take that fact into account. Um, one thing I want to point out to you is as we address the opiate epidemic, we are ensuring to make sure we are addressing it for all citizens of the Commonwealth. As an example, um, this is deaths broken up by actually race and ethnicities. And you'll see on the top, bar, um, that is all cause um, deaths, which sort of tracks our race ethnicity of the state. And in the bottom, you'll see that it is still, the deaths are predominantly in white populations. It's actually predominantly white males, you may have heard. However, one area that we're paying attention to is even though, um, even though that's the case, if you look at the overall deaths for Hispanics, it's 4%, whereas it's disproportionately high at 12% for opiate overdose. So another example of where we're digging deeper into the data to make sure that every population is getting what they need. So as I wrap up, I just want to tell you about an exciting um, project that we're doing around bringing data together at the department in a way that will help us all have the power of data and information to do the work we're doing. We have taken um, information under Chapter 55 legislation um, from many different sectors of state government and are bringing it together in ways we've never done before, like including Department of Correction data, related to opiate data, mass health data, and so on. And just to give you a teaser of some of the preliminary results, um, I'm gonna just show you this. We, um, the dean showed a little bit about incarceration rates. In the US, I want you to see this data as an example. And the full report can be found, found online. This is looking at individuals who are using substances who are released from the Department of Corrections versus other users. And you know the graph shows it all, but what you can see here is that there's a 56 times higher, 56 times higher risk of death when you're released from um, Department of Corrections, and in fact, that's highest in the first month. So this is an example of the kinds of information we're finding by taking existing sources of data and bringing them together in new ways. And this is really helping us talk to our colleagues in the criminal justice system to talk about how do we disrupt our response to the current opioid epidemic, taking into effect the social determinants of, of health. 
and we'll have more to come on this. We're hoping to also do work in this area on maternal child care as well, and look at some of those disparities as well as we bring together data in new and important ways. And finally, um, when I feel unsettled um, and uh, want to do something, I act. So I'm sure all of you feel that way too. And we are um, establishing an Office of Population Health at the department. And that office will really focus on catalyzing our work around data mapping and looking at social determinants of health and making sure we all understand the data inequities to come to our common goal of fighting health inequities and continuing for us to be one of the healthiest states in Massachusetts. I'll close with this, a dear patient of mine, um, when I ask my patients what will it take to make them healthy, um, they would sometimes talk about the medicines I would give them or the appointments to cardiologists, but most importantly, they would talk about something else, something much deeper, being connected to their family, having access to safe housing, and being supported by their community. So on that note, thank you for having me here, thank you for being here today, and we'll go on together.